Welcome everyone, good afternoon. I love watching the participant number rise as you all join us today, thank you so much. If you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat, your name and where you are tuning in from, it's always fun to see where our members are joining us from, so feel free to do that in the panel on the right. All right, welcome. Let's get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan McCauley. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Membership here at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Uh, as always, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today and to uh, start our event by thanking you and sharing my gratitude on behalf of everyone at the Fine Arts Museums for your ongoing membership support. Um, it is no secret that 2020 has been a challenging year for everyone, both at home and at work, and your support is what really keeps us going. So thank you so much for being one of our members. First, I want to make sure that you know that this week the DeYoung Museum has officially reopened its doors. We are in our final day of member and donor previews and will be welcoming the public back into the museum starting tomorrow. For the time being, the Legion of Honor does remain closed, but we'll be reopening the Legion shortly, and so stay tuned to your email for news about those dates. If you'd like to visit the DeYoung, and I hope you will, please note the time tickets are required and you can reserve them in advance on our website. Throughout this challenging year, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco have launched many new initiatives to support our local community. Perhaps most notable among these efforts is the DeYoung Open, the juried community art exhibition featuring submissions by artists who live in the nine Bay Area counties, opening soon at the DeYoung Museum. So our jury reviewed more than 11,000 artworks submitted by more than 6,000 artists and selected 880 works to be installed edge to edge in 19th century salon style in the DeYoung's Herbst Special Exhibition Galleries, our largest exhibition space. For the past three weeks, we have been busy facilitating the safe, socially distanced delivery of the DeYoung Open artworks for the 762 artists featured in the DeYoung Open. It has been an incredible effort across the museums. I can't wait for you to see the exhibition. I'm so excited about it. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our DeYoung Open supporters. That of course includes all of you, our donors, our members, our jurors, our artists, those who contributed to the recovery fund and everyone who has supported us throughout the summer. Today, we are embarking upon a DeYoung Open virtual studio visit with artist and exhibition juror Enrique Chagoya and curator in charge of the Achenbach Foundation for Graphic Arts, Karen Brewer. Karen's out here with us today. Go ahead and turn your video on, Karen. Hi. So Karen Brewer is curator in charge of the Achenbach Foundation for Graphic Arts at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Over the past 35 years, Brewer has curated more than 50 exhibitions at the Legion of Honor and the De Young on subjects as diverse as Richard Diebenkorn's prints, on Rina Tisa's art books, and 20th century landscape drawings. From 1992 to 1995, she directed the curatorial effort of the Achenbach Collection Management Project, a massive computer inventory of the collection. In 2002, she was named Curator of Contemporary Graphic Art and served and curator of New De Young Planning. For the De Young Project, she served as coordinator of the art installation for the 300,000 square foot museum. In 2007, she was named the Achenbach's curator in charge. Her publication projects include the Expressionist Era in Germany, 1900 to 1933, 35 years of Crown Point Press, Japan-esque, the Japanese print in the era of Impressionism, Ed Ruscha and the Great American West, and Ed Hardy, Deeper Than Skin. Hi, Karen. I'll go ahead and hand off to you now. Hope everyone joins me in welcoming Karen. Thanks, Megan, for that very nice introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, Enrique Chigoya, our guest today, was born and raised in Mexico City. His father, a bank employee by day and artist by night, encouraged his interest in art by teaching him color theory and how to sketch at a very early age. As a young adult, Enrique attended the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where he studied economics 
and it was there that he became politically aware. UNAM was the birthplace of the student movement of 1968, which turned into a nationwide rebellion against autocratic rule and began Mexico's three decade journey towards democracy. While he was studying political economics at the university, Enrique worked on a literacy campaign for low income adults in Neza, one of the poorest areas on the outskirts of Mexico City, populated by people who immigrated from the countryside to work, to look for work in the city. He then relocated to Veracruz and directed a team focused on rural development projects, a time he describes as an incredible growing experience that helped him form his strong views on what was happening outside in the world. That sense of political awareness later surfaced in his art. At age 26, Enrique moved to the Bay Area where he enrolled at the San Francisco Art Institute and earned a BFA in printmaking in 1984. He then pursued his MA and his MFA at the University of California, Berkeley, graduating in 1987. Enrique has been exhibiting his work nationally and internationally for over two decades, with a major retrospective organized in the US in 2007 and another in Spain in 2015. His artworks are held in major public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Met, and the Whitney in New York, and SF MoMA and the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, which boasts a whopping 45 works on paper, all of them in the Achenbach Foundation for Graphic Arts. Welcome, Enrique, and thank you so much for being a fellow juror on the De Young Open. It was a daunting task, but you were up for it, and we really appreciate your input. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for such a such a nice introduction. And thank you to the museum and, and thank you for organizing this event. I think since we have very little time and we will have time to talk more at the end of the presentation, why, why don't I start with the presentation? So why don't we just uh, go ahead and, and turn on the, the slideshow. Thank you everybody for uh, having me here today. Um, uh, before I start talking about uh, my most recent work and maybe going to my studio, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and, and experiences in my life that have influenced my work. I'm going to start with um, my family, my mom, um, who was a seamstress and had you know, a very good understanding of what is right and wrong. I mean, she never finished uh, secondary school, but she was incredibly uh, sensitive and smart in her views about people. And most of the times, she was helping people. She had a lamp. She has. She had a lot of empathy for, 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 for many causes. And uh, and in any case, I owe her a lot. Uh, uh, in terms of how I see society and how I see the world. Uh, especially in the 1960s when I grew up in Mexico City, there was a time of uh, turmoil. And my mother uh, was, was uh, important in, in, in my experience. And I'm gonna say how that happened, but um, she was one of the, those influences. The other one is my nanny, uh, Natalia, who was an uh, indigenous woman, uh, in uh, Nahua, which is the same uh, uh, indigenous group as the Aztecs. And she used to speak to me in Nahua. And this is myself with her when I was about three years old. And that influenced very much my, my interest in pre-Columbian cultures, let alone the fact that also I am 51% Native American, according to my ancestry uh, research of my DNA. And, um, you know, I have, uh, I'm going to talk about that later, but in, in any case, um, this was a big influence um, in, in my childhood. Um, in the 1960s, as I was saying, um, were a time of turmoil, not only in Mexico, but all over the world. 
But in Mexico, there was a student movement uh, together with a workers movement. There were so many issues at, uh, at stake, like the rights to work, to, to, I'm sorry, the right to, to, to make strikes, uh, worker strikes, uh, the right of the students to have an influence in their, in their curriculum and in, the, in, in the schools, especially at the university level. And together with another, a lot of many other issues like social inequality and lack of democracy, uh, many political prisoners uh, that were um, arrested. So it exploded before the Olympic Games of 1968. So um, one day my mother, and this is where my mother influenced me, my mother came back home during this time, uh, I was about 15 years old in 1968. She was crying. My mother was crying because she saw a police uh, shooting an 11-year-old kid and killing him in front of her. And she was really, really upset. When she arrived home, she was totally crying. I embraced her. I began to cry with her. And ever since, I wanted to understand what is happening in the world. This is the famous rally of Tlatelolco on October 2nd, a few weeks before the Olympic Games. It was a very peaceful rally. And immediately after, the helicopters flew over and tanks arrived and began to shoot at the crowd. There were about 500 people killed that night. It was an infamous night. Two weeks later or so, the Olympic Games uh, open in Mexico. And this is uh, a memorable moment in the Olympic Games. When the Olympic Games were inaugurated by the Mexican president, Diaz Ordaz, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, the audience at the stadium booed him. He was very unpopular. That was an act of protest at the time. And then when these uh, athletes uh, made this uh, protest in Mexico City, the audience, the whole stadium applauded them. It, it was one of the most memorable moments, not only in Mexico, but probably around the world. As you might recall, the gold medalist, uh, Tommy Smith at the center, and the bronze medalist, John Carlos on the right, um, they won uh, uh, the gold medal, Tommy Smith, and the bronze medal, uh, Carlos, in the 200 meter race. And they are both. If you pay attention to their to their to their uh, sweatshirts, they both wear Olympic Project for Human Rights badges. And the interesting thing is here, also the other athlete, Peter Norman, the silver medalist on the left from Australia, also wears the same badges in solidarity with Smith and Carlos. So, you know, these, these kind of moments at the time of my childhood are etched in my mind and created a lot of interest on, on social issues um, that haven't, kind of, you know, <laughs> that haven't disappeared today. I'm still interested, and I still don't understand uh, most of it anyway. Uh, the other influence in my life is my father. My father is uh, the one here, a firefighter, right in front, uh, holding the hose. He was, uh, you know, very, very athletic. He's a, a, an artist to study art, but he didn't make a living as an artist. Um, since he was a firefighter, he had to work out every day and he became very buff. It was a pretty scary father to have, uh, but he was a very good father for the most part, I say. Um, and he was the first one to teach me uh, how to draw and how to paint. I, at some point, you know, when I was uh, in seven years old or, or so, I, I used to ask him, you know, to draw animals for me, to draw uh, sheep or landscapes, whatever, and he got fed up with me, so he told me to do it myself, and he taught me how to do it. He gave me my first drawing uh, lessons, uh, he showed me how to sketch, and he also uh, taught me uh, color theory, my first, you know, color theory uh, I ever had, around seven years old. So, um, 
it is a portrait of my mother hand colored by my father as you could see maybe he uh, overdid a little bit the the lips a little too red but um he bought a whole set to to color photography at the time it, most of the photography available was in in black and white uh, i'm talking about you know the 50s the late 50s or so so this this is what my father did pretty much you know other things that she did he did later you know, we're paintings. This is one of my father's painting that he painted for me when I moved to the United States because I told him I was missing the agave plants um, that uh, were all over the landscape around Mexico City. And he painted this uh, indigenous uh, person testing the, the, the syrup from the agave plant. In this case, he's testing pulque. Pulque is sort of like a beer it's very sweet in the beginning and it gets more alcoholic as it ages over time. And I have this painting now uh, hanging in my kitchen. In the background is like corn, as you might see. And it's just a very, very rural uh, kind of uh, portrait. So, um, so anyway, my father influenced me in other ways. Uh, he, um, when I was about 10 years old, he took me to his office. He eventually got a different job. He, he stopped being a firefighter and got a job at the Central Bank in Mexico, the Banco de Mexico, which is the mint. That's where they print the money. And uh, his job was internal security. And his job was to catch and, and talk to con artists, to uh, people who were making counterfeit money. So his office was a museum of crime. He, um, he had in his office uh, forgeries of, uh, by, art, by people who did uh, different things, forgeries of Mexican pesos, forgeries of dollar bills, uh, French money, uh, Moroccan money, Cuban money, etc. And he actually used to visit one of the most famous uh, counterfeit artists, uh, San Pietro, and befriended him in prison. And uh, San Pietro did this portrait of my father because my father was bringing him in, in sympathy. He was bringing him some art supplies in, to prison. And so he did this portrait of my father with India ink. And my father was uh, really amazed of his skills. My father, uh, ask him, you know, why did he do that when he was such a good artist? And San Pietro say, uh, you know, my father also asked him, you know, you, you went to the best art schools in France. Um, you uh, came from wealthy families. You didn't need to do this. Why did you do it? And San Pietro, and, and has an Italian last name, but it's French. San Pietro responded to my father, well, I did it for the trials. So, you know, this experience of me going to my father's office in the central bank left a big mark also in my mind when I was very, very young, uh, around 10 years old. Eventually, I went to college and I wanted to study art, but I realized I was not going to be making a living as an artist and maybe my father was the best example, the, the, maybe the wrong role model, but but I was very much interested in, in, in social sciences. So I have, I am here with two of my best friends, uh, two anthropologists. Um, I was studying political economy at the time and philosophy. And I studied briefly anthropology. And I am still friends uh, with the one on the left, Miguel Angel Almanza. He lives in Mexico City. He's an anthropologist. And I'm sorry, he lives in Guanajuato now. And, and the other is Sergio. Martin, and Sergio Espino, no, Sergio Martinez, who uh, moved to the north of the country, I was touching him, with him. But anyway, so we were all very, very involved in politics, organizing uh, student uh, protests. And in, in between, I was still painting, I was still doing, I began to do printmaking. I never stopped drawing or painting since I was, you know, uh, about, 10 years old or seven years old when I started with my, my father teaching me my, my first lessons. And this is one of the uh, woodcuts I did around 1975, actually, that's what it is. 
And it's a woodcut inspired by abstract expressionism, particularly by Helen Frankenthaler, but also it was very much in inspired by Russian constructivist uh, artists. I was very much into artists who participated in, in social changes. And that together with uh, my studies of political economy began to influence what I do as an artist. So uh, I began to participate yeah, as I say, in the very first demonstration after 1968. After 68, after that massacre, there were no longer demonstrations in Mexico. And in 1971, in June, June 10th, uh, art, uh, a lot of uh, my friends and uh, a lot of high school students, I was still in, in, in high school, decided to join this first demonstration in, in 71. And yet there was another massacre their, uh, a different president uh, who was Luis Echeverria, and uh, we almost got killed. Yeah, this is what happened on June uh, of 10, 1971. If you have ever seen the Mexican movie Roma, which was a black and white recent movie, I think from last year, there's a scene where somebody's running after a student inside a, into a store and starts shooting at him. That was that day. Uh, I had to run for my life and I was very lucky to save myself. And the same thing with uh, the few friends I was around with that, that evening. But there were about 70 people who got killed also in, in this one. After this, there was a big movement in Mexico. There were all kinds of violent situations. And the government moved to the left uh, at some point in the late 70s. So by 1976, I began to work in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Mexico, outside of Mexico City, Ciudad Netzahualcoyotl. And I was the artistic director of their, their, their newsletter, but also was doing illustrations for, for books that were used in a literacy campaign for adults. Um, most, most of these adults came from the countryside to work in Mexico City, they took over land illegally and uh, lived there with no services, no running water, no drain, and no doctors, uh, hardly anything. And many, if not maybe most of them were illiterate. So this was a very, very progressive campaign, a nonprofit organization that was Servicios Educativos Populares. And these are some of my early drawings I began to do. Um, you know, beyond the, the woodcut that I showed you before. So eventually, for many different personal uh, reasons, I ended up moving in the U.S. with my first wife, um, Janine, and she used to run this uh, religious magazine. Uh, 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 it's basically, basically uh, uh, an update on Nicaragua. And it's an interfaith, interfaith organization. And they were raising funds for literacy campaigns uh, through religious groups. And at the time, this is 1979, 1981, 82, and 83. Uh, this is from 83. Um, there were a lot of hopes for a, a you know, very positive change in, in Central America. Unfortunately, things got more complicated and, and now they have a pretty terrible dictatorship in Nicaragua, unfortunately. But uh, still there is very good people working there, especially we, within the co religious community. So anyway, so these were some of my illustrations for that magazine and this was published in Berkeley and Oakland actually uh, in, back in, in, in 1983. These are some samples of drawings and I did for different issues like elections in, in Central America and Nicaragua had the first elections then and the, the wishes for a peaceful outcome, which unfortunately, as we all know, didn't quite exactly happen. Anyway, so at the same time, I was studying at the San Francisco Art Institute and this was uh, from 1981 through 1984. And 
I began to get exposure to printmaking, the history of printmaking, which I study at the California Legion of Honor in the, at the Achenbach collection. And the class, the, his, the printmaking history class was, uh, was taught by Robert Johnson, the, at the time the chief curator for prints, uh, the Achenbach. And he was showing us original etchings by Goya, by many, historic figures in printmaking, but I was very much interested in printmaking. When I saw The Disasters of War by Goya, by Francisco Goya, I fell in love with them. And our final project for the class was to make either a paper, write a paper, which I didn't want to, or make artwork uh, based on what we saw. So this was the first time I was tempted to do a look-alike work, you know, in, maybe inspired by my, my dad's office that uh, was full of forgeries. But I wanted to do sort of like a forgery without being a forgery. So uh, I began to do research of things I wanted to include in my, 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 my prints. And um, so I ended up mixing work, like doing this kind of uh, etchings based on Goya. So this was uh, a whole series that I, I did over many years. And unfortunately, I don't have time to show all of them. But uh, this is the, the other one that I, I did after the, the first slide that I show. Uh, against the common good. That's the original title on the bottom of the print, Contra el Bien General. The funny thing is this Ronald Reagan declared, he, declared himself a Contra. And that, so it's, that was perfect for the time when he was basically uh, supporting very violent groups uh, invading Nicaragua, uh, former Somocistas or very ultra conservative groups that were killing a lot of peasants in the countryside. So I decided to make this, this print after I learned all of that. The, the, the other images I have had from other cities is like from the Caprichos, where Goya criticizes uh, superstition pretty much. And, but I have a disclaimer because I don't want to compete with the masters. So I decided to, to show that my hat is too big. His hat was too big for myself. So it's my my satire of myself too. I don't escape even my myself from my own satirical imagery. Even the shoe on the bottom is a rubber stamp I did. The, the shoe is too big for my feet. Other, other influences in my life are my cats. This was my cat Lulu. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away two years ago, but she was the, the most willful, smartest cat I, I, I ever, ever had. Anyway, so she made it into one of my Goya's prints. Uh, here she is as a little bad, bad girl on the bottom. This is uh, a, one of my versions of Goya's. The sleep of reason produces monsters, and it's uh, kind of like a apocalypse etching, which unfortunately is something I could have done today, given all the things that are happening around, especially with all the fires and the smoke. Um, other prints after the, the, the Caprichos were this one I did um, with former President Obama. Uh, this is from uh, 2010. And, you know, two years after his election, and unfortunately, was such a backlash from from white supremacist groups that I decided to include a seal with a KKK chicken right on the bottom with another another stamp. These were published, uh, published by uh, ULIE in Long Island in New York. Around the time I was at the Art Institute, also back when I finished uh, in 1984, there was a camp national campaign uh, organized in New York by art critic uh, Lucy Lippard, and it was an uh, artist call against intervention in Central America. And I decided to participate organizing, uh, together a few other students, at an exhibition at the San Francisco Art Institute uh, on the issue of uh, protesting intervention in Central America by the U.S. government. So I decided to make sort of like an editorial cartoon, but with charcoal. This is seven feet by seven feet. And currently is at the permanent collection of the San Jose Museum of Art. Um, the first time I showed this when it got vandalized, 
uh, it got torn on the sides. You could see, maybe you could see it on the on the right, is the original, and this had torn across the face of Henry Kissinger. So uh, I'm doing a forgery of myself on the left, and I was very happy to be able to make this a conversion as close as possible to the original, including accident accidents and erasing marks that I repeated in, in both uh, drawings. So, so, so I was doing very much the same as the etching is doing something that is very look-alike, a little bit like a forger, but getting away by doing it legally. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is one of my most uh, well-known drawings at the collection of the, the Rosa Preserve in Napa. And this one is called When Paradise Arrived. And it's about uh, this uh, little girl that is being excluded from the mainstream life in the U.S. And it could refer to many, many things. And this is another drawing that could have done today. Uh, this uh, might be uh, reminding us of uh, how immigrant children have been treated. But at the time, I also was thinking about how Native Americans were displaced from their own land, not only in the U.S., but throughout the whole continent. Anyway, so in the middle of the finger, it's hard to read here in the image, but it says English only, referring to the ongoing xenophobia that is happening everywhere, uh, but especially in this country, against uh, people who speak Spanish or other languages. Um, I made this one in 1989. Again, it's something I could have done uh, today. It's incredible how many decades uh, have been passed and the issue is still uh, in, in the front of uh, news. Anyway, so more recent drawings, you know, after the economic collapse, uh, this is my, my portrait of Wall Street. It's called Too Big, referring to Too Big to Fail. And since my studio at the university is right next to a golf course, I decided uh, to make a drawing about uh, golf course characters. And of course, uh, we have a, more than one president that has been playing golf. So it's like a very political kind of imagery without even trying to be political. I have done other versions of dollar bills. This was the Unequal States of America, then uh, $1 billion uh, bill. It was so many zeros, we have to make the, the dollar pretty elongated. So this one is called Federal Economic Privilege Note. I have my signature in the, in the money there, and Don Farnsworth the, from Magnolia has his signature on the other side. So it was a collaboration. This is the back of the, the, the same bill. I might have this one in my next exhibition at uh, Anglian Trimble Gallery, which is opening in October. Another work I wanted to appropriate this one by Charles Weimar, or his original name is Carl Weimar. He's a German immigrant. And this is how he represented the indigenous people who kidnapped uh, Daniel Bond's daughter in 1853, the abduction of Daniel Boone's daughter by the Indians. So I did my version, because for me, the original undocumented immigrants were the pilgrims and especially first the conquistadors, the Spaniards, who were all over North America, all the way to Chesapeake Bay, uh, and about at least 50 years before the pilgrims arrived there, and all the way to the West Coast through California. And, uh, but, and then the pilgrims, and then many other immigrants from Europe who didn't have passports, and they acted against the law of the land of many local indigenous uh, groups and nations. So, uh, and I decided to use this stereotype from a sports team uh, use to, to show the indignity of how Native Americans had been represented from historic paintings to contemporary items. This is my, my newest version of it. And also with Native American masks, this one from the Northwest, and a Mayan, and I left an original indigenous character on the other one. And you could barely read, but I made the letter smaller, border patrol on, on the boat. 
and you might recognize. I wanted to put Donald Trump, but I decided I'm too tired of his face now. I already did it in an engraving, so I don't want to keep painting him. And I decided to, to have an avatar, which is Donald Duck. Now I'm going to move to my books, my codices. And this is, um, this is how the Spanish uh, soldiers and the uh, Franciscan priests executed indigenous leaders who didn't want to convert into Christianity. So this was during the conquest of Mexico City in, in the years 1519 through 1521. Uh, that was a, a massacre that happened in, in the city, but also not only a genocide throughout the continent and in Mexico as well, where 90% of the indigenous population was very much gone within the first hundred years after the conquest. That, that's a major holocaust that, that uh, it, it's, uh, has very few parallels in the world. And unfortunately, besides the genocide, there was a culture side. There was a cultural destruction. All the books, it's one of the few areas in the world where printed books were, I mean printed books, uh, painted books were done. And they were burned. They were burned. Uh, the biggest library of the continent in Texcoco, which was, by the way, built by an architect and poet and artist king, King Nezahualcóyotl, who opposed human sacrifices at the peak of the Aztec Empire. And he had thousands of thousands of books with uh, calendaric uh, uh, information, with uh, medicinal information, with mythological information, historic information that were lost until today there is not a single aztec book that survived the fire um, there are aztec books that were painted immediately after the conquest but not any pre-columbian aztec books um, there are about three mayan books that survive uh, maybe four if the one in mexico city there are some fragments of one uh, are good. The three Mayan books that survive are in Spain, the Codex Madrid, one in France, the Codex Paris, and one in Germany, the Codex uh, Dresden. And then the Codex uh, Mexico City, uh, which uh, originally, originally was, I believe, I believe was, I don't remember the original name, but it's in Mexico City. Anyway, so um, there are about 19 other per columbian books from the Oaxaca area, from the Mixtec Zapotec. And I used those uh, uh, ancient imagery together with contemporary imagery that is very visual. I grew up with, especially with things like Superman in Spanish. I, I have uh, a lot of these um, the comics is still saved from from my my teenage years. So I mix pre-Columbian imagery, like this one, this is, a, this is an Aztec book, but painted after the conquest by, by Fernando de Alba Ixtlisochitl, who described actually the library in Texcoco, and he, he was an Aztec noble who was an artist as well, and this is how he represented the god Tlaloc, the god of rain, with, with a thunder in his hand. So I showed this one at the De Jong Museum when I had my solo show in 1994. It's called Crossing. And I made Superman as a perfect alien because as you recall, he's an alien from out of space and as an undocumented uh, pilgrim here <laughs> facing uh, an indigenous character on the right. I have done many, many codices in different ways. This is a letter press. A book is called Codex Spangliensis, which I did in collaboration. Uh, the text is uh, by Guillermo Gomez Peña, performing artist, and Moving Part Press, Parts Press, by Felicia Rice, who was a designer of the edition. Unfortunately, Moving Parts Press is burned to ashes uh, in Santa Cruz. It just got destroyed about two weeks ago by the fires in Santa Cruz. And Felicia Rice lost all of her archives, including whatever was left for these books. 
and her press is everything in that press. And she moved to Mendocino, and I hope she's okay because now Mendocino has some big fires. But anyways, some in pages from the Codex Spangliensis um, are this one, they are hand painted. Originally it's, it's in black and red, but I hand color it. Um, and here's like two uh, versions uh, of Western and non-Western femininity, maybe. Um, here I decided to make a portrait of King Nezahualcoyo, the one who built the library on Texcoco. Uh, he, although he was a, 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 a king who was against human sacrifice, nevertheless, he, he ran an empire and, you know, he was represented as a warrior by Fernando de Alba Ixtlisochitl as well. Anyway, I'm going to keep moving on to other uh, elements. Uh, as I say, I talk, I, I, I work with stereotypes and sometimes I find, find like, treasures that, you know, are incredible collections of racist, colonialist stereotypes, like this, this uh, stamp collecting uh, book, The Ra Human Races and Flags of the Universe. So these are some of the pages. Uh, these are some of the, the characters sometimes uh, I, I, I use in my work. So I wanted to humanize the stereotypes because beyond, behind every stereotype, there is a, a, a real human being. So I decided to put myself in the stereotypes. Now, especially because my DNA is so mixed. I am, as I say, 51% Native American. I am 38% or so uh, from, from Spain, from, from the uh, Iberian Peninsula. And about the other 10%, I am uh, Jewish. I am uh, Ashkenazi Jewish. I am uh, also Arabic from Northern Africa. I am a Southern Asian, I am Eastern Asian, and even a little bit of Northern European. <laughs> so I'm from everywhere, I'm from nowhere, and my genes get along with each other, otherwise I will be dead. So, um, Anyway, I decided to, to make a codex based on, on that. And I have done actually different books and until today, I keep working on that. This is uh, on found pages at the San Francisco dump. And was a present I got from my wife, artist Cara Maria, uh, the, the book pages. So I decided to paint over them. I deacidified the pages of the book. Um, and then I painted over with acrylic and then water-based uh, mixable, water mixable oils on top. I went back to Magnolia and decided to make a codex uh, on metal. And this is on aluminum. We make a small edition of these books. And it's uh, all printed with a flatbed digital printer. And the oxidation of the acid is with, is with acid in the metal. Very interesting process. I use more pages of the same book to, to make more codices, like this one, The Mindful Savage Guide to Reverse Anthropology. Um, I like to think I'm doing the opposite of Picasso or the opposite of uh, art historian, seeing the Western history through non-Western eyes. These are other books I did based uh, on those stereotypes, but in this case, I'm trying to to dissolve the, the stereotypes. This one is called Aliens Sans Frontiers, like a sequel, uh, or Aliens Without Borders. So the same thing, it's more like a border wall and people don't, you, you barely see uh, different faces here, but they have, some of them have glass eyes and so on. Now I'm going to finish my, my talk with just a brief visit to my studio at Stanford University. Uh, this is a flock of friends that I have that visit on and off. I hope they are okay with all the smoke all around Palo Alto right now. I haven't been very often in my studio because we were, we were not allowed to go into the studio 
This is my studio inside. This is the former studio of Nathan Oliveira. So which for me is a privilege to be in, in this space. I'm gonna show you a brief video of the of the studio. I have a really beautiful view of the, the canvas. I'm still afraid of uh, messing it up too much. These are some of the most recent work I've, I've been working on that I'm gonna show I, again in my upcoming exhibition at Anglin Trimble Gallery that opens in October 1st. So this is where I usually work. You know, I listen to the radio right now. You might hear a little bit of noise from the radio from NPR or I play music and whatever, and I get all kinds of books that I access for more imagery on my work. I have a photocopy machine in the back and a little press, uh, etching press on the right. Sometimes I do some Xerox transfers there. Now this is uh, where I am today in my house. Uh, and this is my COVID-19 studio and now the fire storm studio. I haven't been able to go to my studio very often. Even my, my studio is open now. But this is where I'm working on the table, uh, right in the dining room. Anyway, so this is the final work I am showing, beginning October 1st. And uh, this is based on the seven deadly scenes by Ensor, one of my favorite artists, James Ensor, the Belgium artist. And this one is called Greed. You might be able to see the, the letters in the middle of the mess of this turkey. And um, this one is called Pride with Snow White in, in the white picture. This one is called Sloth with very unhealthy food being eaten. A, a little pet on the bed, this, this little roach, or big roach, actually. Um, this one is a scary one. Uh, this one is called Envy. You could see the titles of the seven deadly scenes somewhere in the picture. Here one, you see the Envy on the, on the belt of the, the, this white supremacist soldier. This one here, uh, an Im immigrant girl, like the ones who were separated and keep being separated in the U.S.-Mexican border. With the I am you, this is based on the I am a man sign protesting the civil rights movement by pretty much carried by African-Americans, uh, African-American men. And I decided that like myself, I have genes from so many places that this is a human being, a child in this case, that is just like you or me. So this sign is mostly for empathy. And if you could see the 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 Atabar that I did of the Donald uh, Donald Duck on the upper right, the eyes are a skull. All all of my my deadly and seven deadly scenes have skulls in them. This is one of the original etchings by Ensor. This one's called Slot. No, I'm sorry, Lust. Slot was the, the other one. This one is Lust. And you can read the sign on top of the bed. Lust. And thankfully, it had a skeleton already on the original. And here you could see basically the avatars for China on the left, Russia, and, and Richie Rich, that's for the US. And the last of the seven scenes is gluttony. And I decided to include this religious figure on the left. This is a version of a previous work I showed at the Dion Museum also. Uh, it's a new version of it, The Governor's Nightmare. And on the upper left, there is a religious image of the blood of Christ. So like they're representing the first communion with the blood of Christ. So just to make a symbolic connection that in this case, the Aztec God of death here on the pyramid is having like a first communion too with Donald Duck and, and Richie Rich, which is a handful of dollar, dollar bills. So I want to finish this with just a happy picture that when I see, um, makes me remember better times, my cat Lulu, 
she is working here very hard on a self-portrait. And with this, I thank you, all of you, for uh, listening to such a long uh, slideshow. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Enrique. That was a wonderful presentation. Our, we have lots of questions in the Q&A. I'm smiling. Uh, the ending picture was certainly a happy image, so thank you. Thank Karen, you. would you like to? What, what do, can, I, can I add a, a few things I didn't say that uh, I, I, I neglected to say? The name of my parents. <laughs> I should name everybody's name. Because my parents, that they are too familiar to me, I guess I didn't need to introduce them. But my mother's name was Ophelia. And my father's name was like me, Enrique Chagoya as well. Um, so, so those were the, the things I, I just wanted to, to, to um, just correct myself or to add because I'm sorry I didn't say it, <laughs> but now I do. Thank you. And I'm happy to jump in with a few questions. Uh, this first question, I'm, I'm going to combine two questions. Uh, it is, you use, Enrique, you use a lot of cartoon imagery, Superman, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse in your work. Are these cartoon images remembered from childhood or from your exposure to pop culture as an adult in the US? And another question related, have you ever run into copyright issues with the use of those comic book figures? Uh, okay, it, well, no, I think uh, my answer will answer both. Uh, the, they are not, in my work, they are symbolic elements of cultural colonialism. In other words, they are not the original innocent cartoon characters. In my work, Donald Duck is an avatar for Donald Trump, or uh, sometimes Mickey Mouse is an avatar for Columbus, or for uh, conquistadors, or things like that. And when I put uh, Mickey Mouse in front of the, the disasters of war, it becomes kind of, kind of like a yin and yang, uh, a commentary on Disney World that if you recall, when you go to Disney World, you read in the entrance, welcome to the happiest place on earth. And I decided to put it next to the unhappiest place on earth, which is war and people fighting people. I mean, we are ourselves our own enemies. The our worst enemies uh, of people are other uh, human beings. So because I use the cartoon imagery in a critical manner, I've been so far getting away with copyright issues because that's one of the exceptions of the copyright law, that if you're using copyrighted material in a critical statement, you can use it. Uh, I would be in trouble if I just made a Mickey Mouse by itself and, and without permission from Disney, yes, I would be in deep trouble. But so far, as long as you change the original essence of the cartoon character, then you are fine. Uh, and Superman sometimes play the role of a pilgrim, of, a, of an undocumented alien from out of space, uh, and an imperialist kind of character. So Superman is not necessarily the hero as, uh, you know, as I grew up as a child. Uh, also, things change when you're a child. You are, you know, you are not so critical. I grew up thinking, you know, Mickey Mouse was Mexican because the, the original, when I was like five years old, six years old, when I began to read uh, and I got the first comic books in my hand, Mickey Mouse was translated in Spanish as El Raton Miguelito. And, you know, it wasn't until maybe I was uh, older, uh, maybe a, a few years after that I realized that this was a translation from an American comic. But, but that gives you an idea a little bit how cultural exposure from a kid to uh, adulthood changes the, the perception and the meaning of uh, something as simple as a cartoon character. So I think, I, I hope I answered both, both questions with, with one. You did, thank you very, very much. Um, the other thing I think a lot of our viewers appreciated today was a, a sneak peek at your two studios. Um, now that you've had to develop both a home studio, um, do you prefer it to your campus studio? Or post-COVID, would you prefer to keep both your home and campus studios active? 
Well, at home I cannot make big paintings. That's the only problem. And, and my upcoming exhibition is going to be with a small work. Uh, mostly like the paintings I show today, as you saw it on the walls there, about 12 inches by 16 inches. And I, I did a codex, I did a, a new book, but I was painting two pages at a time and then I put them together, but I was able to work at home. So it depends. The, the only reason I actually like uh, working at home on a small uh, works is because it saves driving, it saves gas. Uh, I, I'm not polluting, I, I'm also, I, I'm not wasting time in, because it takes me about a good 40 minutes to get to my studio from San Francisco. But when I'm in my studio, I'm really happy working there too. And also it's such a beautiful studio that sometimes I'm not totally comfortable there because, especially because it was Nathan Oliveira's studio. He was one of my favorite artists. I met him many times, I really like him. So it's, for me, it's a big privilege to be in, in such a studio. And Nathan is the one who got the money to make those studios possible. So I, I, anybody who has stayed in that studio besides me and had been other faculty at Stanford, owes to Nathan Oliveira the existence of such beautiful studios. There are two of those, and then there are other studios, but in a different location, a school for faculty next to the grad studios. But, but yeah, that's uh, how I appreciate both studios. I'm very lucky. I hope eventually uh, I might have a nicer place at home to work here where I could make a mess maybe, and I could leave the studio for somebody else uh, at Stanford. Well, and I imagine Lulu must like having your company, perhaps at home. Yeah. <laughs> we have lots of people in the chat who love the photo of Lulu. Oh, Lulu was amazing. Uh, I mean, I miss her. I mean, she, as I say, she passed away two years. Mm -hmm. I have a video of her just playing football and I'm not gonna torture the audience with more about her. But uh, no, she, uh, she, she was uh, an amazing cat. She used to talk, she talked back and mumble words, she mumble words. She say hello, she just say hello. Amazing. It was a little scary, <laughs> she, was, she was really, really smart. Well, I'll jump in with a question here from our viewers. Uh, this is from Piruleta Ortiz, who says, Hi, Kike, how do you manage to keep being active in what's going on politically without getting burnt out and maintaining a sense of humor and optimism? Well, I have, uh, I have fallen uh, burnt out at least once, <laughs> like five years ago, I was like, I had uh, my exhibition from Spain was traveling and I couldn't go to the last opening in the Canary Islands, which is a beautiful place. They were paying me for everything. I was so exhausted uh, in 2015. I, I felt I was going to die if I kept uh, the pace, so I took a break. But, um, but humor, in the other hand, uh, I mean, I have to, to take a break from too many commitments to saying yes to everything because I used to do that. Uh, now I take it easy. I make more selective decisions about where I show my work and when. And humor is something that I just have since I recall. I, I grew up in a family that used to bully everybody at dinner time or at lunch time, and but with a joke. If if everybody laugh uh, because somebody make a joke about you. If you didn't respond back uh, with another joke, you lose. So I, I learned how to play that way. And, um, and also in general, in Mexico, there is a human sense, sense of humor, actually, uh, which uh, has perhaps cultural roots. But Mexicans tend to make jokes about death. And you, this could be something from pre-Columbian influences, from pre-Columbian cultures where life and death were seen different than the Europeans. In ancient cultures, life was a dream. And when you die, you woke up. You always went to a heaven. There was no idea of hell. Um, it was day of the dead every time somebody died. It didn't have to be just on November 2nd, but any time. And that and many other costumes from pre-Columbian times uh, coexist today in a mixed culture of, uh, you know, indigenous and European. And eventually Mexico also got more, more complex with uh, the, the African influence, which exists uh, very, is still very, very richly in, in the coast, in the Gulf and Oaxaca. So uh, there is this kind of mix of cultures in Mexico that 
that brings some sense of humor that I notice is different than the sense of humor here. It's not that Americans don't have a sense of humor, they do. It's just a different context and a different sense of humor. I could not make jokes of earthquakes, for instance, like people in Mexico do. Here, it would be really, really bad taste. <laughs> so I stay away from that. But humor, in a way, is a defense against the worst circumstances uh, for enjoying life. It, it's like a smile when you're supposed to be crying, and, but it's a sincere uh, hope uh, that you have to survive that the smile gives you. And, and you, you, you smile sincerely because somebody says something that crack you up and, and takes you out of the, the fear. And sometimes I am a person who cracks the joke and I made somebody else laugh, I hope. Be besides getting people offended because sometimes that happens too. I have to say, I, I feel quite moved by that as an idea about the about to laugh so that you're not crying. It was really beautiful. Um, so I know that it is six o'clock, but I want, if you don't mind, to sneak in one final sure. question. Okay, um, there's so many great questions. So I am going to ask from Thomas. Uh, Enrique, can you discuss the difference between art as decoration and art that addresses change and transition, art that challenges the viewer to consider new ideas and embrace mystery? Well, it's two different things. I, uh, certainly, I, 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 don't know, I don't want to compare uh, apples and oranges because they are two different things. I don't have anything against any artist who like to do something decorative because that could be beautiful designs. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the, my favorite concepts from political artists in the Russian Revolution, the constructivist artists, have the idea of unifying art and life. And some of those ideas wanted to mix design on everything. So instead of painting flowers on a vase, somebody will have to design a beautiful vase. And for, from that perspective, art and life will become the same. Just like in ancient cultures where basically architecture, painting, sculpture were mixed, very often unified by a religious concept, like among you know Aztec and, and Mayan or ancient Central American cultures uh, or Inca or the same with the Egyptian cultures and all the way to the Renaissance where you know religion unified all of that at the same time so the Russian constructivists have a similar idea and for them that will end the the, the bourgeois museums <laughs> sorry for the young you're not one of those but that was the concept that was the idea how do you unify art and life now, content, political content and political critique in art is something that also have existed forever. It, and many artists in the Russian Revolution and other revolutions in the Mexican Revolution, even the Cuban Revolution, whether or not the revolutions got corrupted, that's a different story. But the artists who participated in those revolutions were very creative in terms of the concepts they developed to unify a critical content. Like the muralist decided to make art for the masses, art for the people that criticize colonialism that will hopefully change people's perception of the world and hopefully will trigger changes. Same thing happened with the Cuban posters that happened you know, during, during the first years of the revolution, the cinema posters, some fabulous posters in Cuba and and so on so the russian revolution again also inspired many expressions of abstract art in the beginning and the ones that end up being the more socialist uh, experiments that i i think they fail in a way were the ones that were controlled by the state without having total freedom for the artists and the so-called socialist realism has been already criticized by many art philosophers and critics like Adolfo Sanchez Vasquez, a, a Spanish refugee who I used to listen at the university. He, he had books on, on art and Marxism. He criticized socialist realism for not being socialist and not being realism either. <laughs> so, I mean, we could talk hours about this thing. It's fascinating, but I think the question, that, that was a very good question. And Thank you. I, I, I would like to, somebody ask a question about one painting I did, the, the mm -hmm. uprising of the spirit. That's right, yes. Somebody asked about the uprising of the spirit, which they saw. Yeah, yeah I think that relates to my, my concept of uh, the contrast between pre-Columbian cultures 
and the Western cultures that were represented with Superman. And the, the character is, as I mentioned in one of my codices, the character there is King Nezahualcóyotl, who, who is represented as a warrior against Superman. So it's two different kinds of heroes from two different perspectives. And it's, again, my yin and yang in, in that. And in that painting, curiously, on the corner, I have a little Russian constructivist uh, painting. I, I think it's a painting by Elisinski. The, the, the wedge, uh, the red wedge against the, the white army or something like that. It's like a red triangle against the white circle. It's, it's out of the Russian Revolution. Ah, oh, so it is connected. And yeah. you'll have to tell, tell everyone, if you can, please, uh, when you're, you mentioned that you have an exhibition that's opening late in October. Can you tell yes, everyone where October. it is? Yeah, uh, I'm going to bring the work on October 1st. It's an it's a Anglim Trimble gallery. It's going to be an Anglim Trimble. This, this is the gallery that usually, it used to be, a Paula Anglim Gallery, but you know, as everybody knows, uh, unfortunately, Paula passed away in 2015, I believe. Uh, and and this year, the the director who was running the gallery, Ed Gilbert, also passed away. Um, oh. it, that was uh, just uh, just few months ago. Out of, he died from cancer, but it, the, the gallery was. Uh, Paula Anglim, uh, I'm sorry, Anglim Gilbert Gallery. All right. Now, beginning October is going to change names. So it's going to be, yeah, I, I hope I'm not disclosing it too early because it's uh, something that <laughs> that uh, the new director wanted to do, but it's going to be Anglim Trimble Gallery. And that's what I'm having in my upcoming exhibition. It's still in the same address at Minnesota Street. And they're going to open to the public with some uh, by appointment, and they're going to follow COVID nineteen restrictions, and they're very cautious. So, I hope people might be able to to see it, and you know, bring your astronaut suit. So <laughs> that's right. We wear our beekeepers' <laughs> costumes and all of our masks. Absolutely. Well, Enrique, I have to I can't thank you enough for your time today for sharing. Um, your work, your process, your history, your family with us. Thank you so much from everyone at the Fine Arts Museums. And Karen, thank you also for having us all here today and helping us host this wonderful conversation. Um, I, do, I do want to note that this week, after more than six months of temporary closure, we have finally reopened the De Young Museum to members. So if you have not yet made a reservation to visit, you can certainly visit our website at deyoung.famsf.org or email membership at famsf.org to make a reservation. You must have a time ticket to enter the De Young, and I highly recommend booking advance because we have been selling out these early tickets. If you'd enjoyed today's event, please consider making a tax-deductible gift at donate.famsf.org. Your donations help us serve more than 1.4 million people, including families, students, and other art lovers every year. A gift in any amount makes a tremendous impact, and we appreciate your support so much. Again, that's donate.famsf.org. You should see a poll on screen, so please do take a moment to give us your feedback if you don't mind. And again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Remember to reserve your advanced tickets to the De Young Museum and keep an eye on your email for news about the Legion of Honor, as well as the De Young Open Exhibition, which uh, Karen and Enrique were both jurors on. That will also open next month. And if you have any questions about what's on view or how to redeem your membership benefits, you can always reach the membership team at membership at famsf.org. So again, thank you so much to Karen. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you. And, and thank you, everybody, for listening to my talk. Thank you, Karen. Yeah.